So last year, you know, this is, um, I, I thought, you know, I would document how I, how I think. <laughs> it's kind of scary, but it's like how I go through the process of doing things. And so like I go down one rabbit hole and leads to another rabbit hole. And I thought I'd just share with you um, a journey I went on uh, since last year and why I ended up where I did. So, so basically I'm going to quote Charlie Morris here is that this is not a tutorial. It's a log. Okay. Um, my background is not engineering. It's uh, I, I, you know, I was trained as an experimental physicist way, way back. And so I know, or I understand how to do experiments. And that's how I learn is by doing experiments. And that's why I love LT Spice so much is that I can go and I can experiment and I can test things and I can prove or disprove what's going on and I figure things out. So basically how this journey started, and I, I, I talked a little bit about this last week as a, as a teaser, but uh, last year I purchased an Ender 3D printer and uh, Eric and I got together, set it up. And uh, as I, I bought the cheaper, uh, the cheaper unit, and I found out there's a whole bunch of mods for it. So as I was looking for mods, there's a laser module you can buy and you could strap onto it. And then as I was looking at this laser module, I stumbled across some people that were using them to etch PCB boards. And I thought, oh, that is cool. How did, how did these laser modules work? Nudge, nudge, wink, wink, first rabbit hole. So I started looking at this and uh, they use laser diodes here. And these laser diodes are typically low voltage, but higher current. And uh, these modules, they use pulse width modulation to control the voltage. And so a lot of them, they use a buck converter to step down um, the voltage. So they take like a 12 volt feed, because most of these things, I think it's uh, these, um, extruders are run on 12 volts. Dwayne probably knows a lot more than me, but they run in a higher voltage and they have to be stepped down uh, via this buck converter to power the laser diode. And you can control the uh, uh, laser power by varying the pulse width modulation of the, of the uh, diode. So this is a map of the rabbit holes I went down. So I first started looking at laser modules and then they use buck converters. And I thought, Hey, you know what? I've seen these buck converters all over the place. How do they work? So I, I tried, you know, creating experiments, modeling it, and I couldn't get the damn thing to work. So that led me to go down the first rabbit hole of inductors because these things are based on a inductor and it's some of the things they were saying. It's it's something we all know. We hear, oh, an inductor is used to delay uh, the current. It delays the phase, and it, uh, you know, it uh, opposes changes in current, and it does anything it can to keep the voltage uh, the same, and blah blah blah. And I was looking at that and going, what the heck does that mean? How does it do that? So rabbit hole number one. So the buck converter relies on a MOSFET. I couldn't make it work. So I had to go and figure out, okay, why can't this thing work with the MOSFETs I put in? So rabbit hole number two, and that had to do with a lot of the capacitance um, that are associated with, with MOSFETs. So once I you know, learned a little bit more about MOSFETs, Peter and I, Peter, what was this, three years ago, two years ago? We were yeah, it was before a year before COVID. Yeah, we were working on this uh, transceiver called I you know called the Dueling 612, 612s, and it was based on two SA 612s mixers with a crystal filter amp in between, and it came out of a, a design by Pete Gi Giuliano. And so we built this thing, and it it worked. I was able to make contacts. But then I found out it was very, very dirty. The power amp is extremely dirty. So then I started revisiting the power amp of that uh, 
uh, design. And as I was doing that, that led me down two additional rabbit holes where to look at the pure, purity of the power amp, I had to do an FFT and L LT spice. And I thought I knew how to do an FFT and LT spice, but I didn't know Jack. It's fairly complex. So I had to go back to first principles for FFT and, and uh, refresh my memory about how it works. And the other powerful piece that uh, came out of this was using LT spice measurements to automate your, your measurements. Because going and running a simulation and going and measuring the peak to peak voltage for each amp, it's, it's nonsense. So there are ways that you could automate your measurements and you could run formulas and you could do all kinds of things. So I was able to go and uh, uh, um, use that to characterize various power amps. So this is, uh, so when I looked at the buck converter, okay, um, the way it works, and you guys may already know this, and if, if you do, you know, watch Netflix or something, but basically what it is, it's got a diode and it only allows current to flow in one direction. It's got an induct inductor and it's got a capacitor which charges and then you've got your load. Okay, so the way it works when it's open, there's nothing flowing. So you close it, current starts to flow. So, and I'm assuming current's going from minus to plus from a low voltage to a higher voltage. So it's, it's flowing this way and it goes across the inductor, charges the capacitor and, and makes it through the load. And everything you read says, oh, the, the uh, inductor opposes the current. And so therefore it builds up a more positive charge on this side and a more negative charge on that side. And like, I'm scratching my head going, how the hell does it do that? So then when the switch is open, so now current stops flowing this way. And so now the diode, current flows through the diode. The inductor becomes a battery, minus the plus. Current flows this way and it's dumped into the load and the capacitor also discharges as well. And you can see this. Here, so the blue line is when the switch is, when it's at one, when the blue line here is at one, the switch is, is closed. So here you can see the current coming up and uh, it's, it's raising up through the inductor. The inductor is opposing it. Then when it reaches fully, full charge, it's the switch is opened and it starts uh, discharging. And you repeat this over and over again, and you get uh, a net current or a net uh, voltage coming out. So what the way I arrived at that was that I stumbled across this guy on the uh, uh, YouTube. He He's a professor at uh, this university here, at Arizona State or something like that. And so he had a lecture where he talks about these uh, uh, buck converters and he does a design and he says, okay, this is the parameters I want. You know, um, I want 36 volts in, I want 12 volts out. That's my switching frequency. That's my load, blah, blah, blah. That's how much ripple I want. And here's the equations and here's what I'm gonna come up with. So uh, this design here, with these values, which I use, by the way, uh, is going to produce 12 volts output and it's going to produce 10 amps output. So I thought, okay, great. Let me simulate that in LT Spice. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, spoiler alert, I tried doing it with a MOSFET and it didn't work. So what I did, I said, okay, well, let me check, see if it's the MOSFET. Again, I did an experiment. So I said, let me replace the MOSFET and let me put a voltage control switch in and let me see if I can get it to work. Because if this works with a voltage control switch, then I know it's a MOSFET problem. So I designed this experiment to go and test it out. And sure enough, it works and it works perfectly. So I've got two plot planes here. And by the way, if you want to know how to do the two uh, plot planes in the LT Spice, you right click on the plot area 
and you select add a plot plane and a second plot plane will come up and you can put different uh, plots in there for the same simulation. So here you're seeing the voltage in green uh, at V out and you can see the voltage is around 12 volts. It's got a little bit of ripple. So sure enough, I'm getting about 12 volts out. And the bluish line here, that's the current flowing through the load. And sure enough, I'm getting roughly around 10 amps coming out. And the red here is the switching frequency. That's just the uh, this switch being open and closed. Okay, now the bottom plot is showing the voltage across the inductor. So I'm trying to understand why they say it's it's more positive on one side or more negative on the other side. So I thought, okay, let me see if this is what's happening in real life. So by the way, if you want to know how to use the switch, the voltage control switch, if you go to this wiki page, it's got all the details of how to use a switch, how to set up a, a, a switch, a voltage control switch. So, so if you look at when the switch is off, Okay, so the switch is off here. So green, I, I messed up this uh, the colors here. Red should have been the switch, but red is actually uh, the voltage output. So it's V out, the voltage here, minus the voltage here. So it's the voltage difference across here. Okay, so red is actually the voltage difference across the inductor, and the green is the switching, is a switch being uh, open and closed. So... With the switch um, closed, with it uh, zero, you see you get 12 volts. You get, um, it's more positive on this, on the outside, right? So it's it's a positive voltage. But when the switch comes on, is that right? Do I have it backwards? No, I've got it backwards. When the switch is, is closed, when the switch is open, the voltage goes uh, negative. No, 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 that's right, that's right. Sorry, I'm, I'm confusing myself. So when the switch is now um, open or uh, closed, so you get a really negative voltage. So VI is bigger than V out. So the voltage is, is in fact building up here. You're getting a bigger voltage when the switch is closed because the inductor is uh, opposing the current going through it. So you're gonna get a, a higher voltage here than here. So sure enough, you're getting a negative voltage when the switch is closed and you're getting a positive voltage when the switch is open and the inductor is in fact acting as a battery. So we have a happy cat, this appears to be working. I still don't understand why it's going positive and negative, but that'll come in, in, due, in due time. Uh, Dave? So, yep. Yeah. Do you mean due time in a couple of slides or in due time down the road? A couple of slides. Okay. Okay. So, so here now is I put a IRF 510 and I, and I put the, uh, uh, a voltage to it, to the gate to turn it on and off. And I got 104 millivolts out, like not a happy cat. So it's like, what the heck am I doing wrong here? So this started the journey down the rabbit holes. So after I went and I investigated MOSFETs, I actually, it's a dope moment here. And you'll see later on is that these MOSFETs have a VGS. In order for them to turn on, the gate voltage must be higher than the source voltage by a certain amount. And I think for the IRF 510, it's three or four volts. It's of that order. Okay, so I was putting five volts in because I'm used to the, the, the um, what's this, the source being grounded. So if it's at zero volts, right, then five volts would surely turn it on. But in this case, it's not zero volts. It's, it's some voltage um, that's, that's going across. So that's why this didn't work. So anyway, that leads now into the first rabbit hole of what an inductor is doing. Any questions so far? 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about magnetic field. There's no equations. There's no math. There's This is all pictorial stuff, LT spice stuff I'm doing. So first of all, I'm going to just talk about, uh, oh, by the way, yeah, and, you know, you guys, I'm sure many of you are, already know this. Um, you know, you may have forgotten it, may have misunderstood it. Some of you may not know this, but this was a refresher to me because uh, I studied physics like 30 years ago and I had to go back to like, what's Faraday's law? What's Lenz's law? Uh, what does it mean? And so, um, so I'll go through some of this stuff purely from a hand waving high level perspective, just to explain what an inductor is doing. So we start off our journey by, you know, you've got a uh, piece of wire and you've got a magnetic field around it. I'm sure in your grade school math, you took iron filings and you put it around the wire and you got the iron filings to go around in circle, right? So that's a standard science experiment I think we all have done. And there's a magnetic field going around the wire. And that's what the right hand rule is for. You, you point your thumb in the direction of current and your fingers curl in the direction of the magnetic flux. So now if you take that straight wire and you bend it on itself, well, those, those concentric circles also bend. And if you keep bending it, the concentric circles keep bending and eventually you end up with a with a, a magnetic field like a bar magnet. So then your coil, that's how you get a magnetic field going through your coil. It's just by adding up all these um, uh, flux lines going around the, um, that's perpendicular to the flow of current, it's coming around and it's still perpendicular to the flow of current but the floor current now is going around in a circle. So you get a whole bunch of these lines and it becomes like a toroid. Here you're looking down the center and so you're, it becomes like a toroid. Okay, makes sense, right? So now, so with that same coil, we now go to Faraday's law. And Faraday's law says that if you've got a piece of wire a coil of wire, a, a, a length of wire, and that wire has a changing magnetic field. So the changing magnetic flux across that wire, it, it induces a voltage and a current in that coil. If the coil is um, terminated, you've got some kind of a load, you'll get a current. If it's not uh, terminated, you just get an EMF, you just get a voltage across the points. So if you're a bug and you're sitting on this wire and someone is moving this magnetic, this uh, bar, this magnet towards you, you're going to be seeing these lines changing because each one of these lines is a flux line and you're seeing a changing magnetic field. So that changing magnetic field is inducing a voltage and a current in that coil. And that should come as no surprise because that's how a generator works, right? You've got You've got two magnets and you've got uh, some wire and you spin it around and it generates a current in that wire and you're taking mechanical work and you're converting mechanical work into electrical energy and uh, Einstein and the boys are happy. You're not violating any laws in thermodynamics. So, and here's a little uh, video of uh, showing that uh, as this is moving, you'll see the coil of wire seeing different magnetic field lines crossing it. So as it's going, as these magnetic field lines are crossing the wires, it's inducing a voltage and a current in this coil of wire. If the coil is terminated, it's going to induce a current. Obviously, no current can flow if there's not a, a return path. Makes sense, right? Pretty straightforward stuff. No rocket science there. So this is the rock. Now we get to something a little bit more meat. So if you've got a coil and you've got a battery and you've got a switch, okay, if the switch is open, okay, there's no current flowing through this coil. So the current going through it is zero. When you close that switch, 
the current is going to go to say one amp. So because the current is going from zero to one amp, the magnetic field in this coil is changing. The magnetic field has to change. Forget about imposing or any of that stuff. It's the current is, has to ramp up through the coil. And as it's ramping up, the coil, um, the magnetic field is growing. Now, as that magnetic field is growing, it's going to induce a voltage and a current in itself. So here, let me just show you the animation here. So you can see the current flowing through, and you can see the field building up. The field's building, 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 building. Now, as the field is building, those magnetic field lines are changing, and it's inducing a voltage and a current in this coil. Now, the thing to think about, okay, is which direction is that current going to flow in? And if you think about it, okay, the current, let's say that the current is flowing this way, okay? If it induces a voltage and a current, and the current is, is, um, uh, is in the same direction as the original current, then you would get an increase in current, then you'd get an increase in field, you get another increase in current, you get another increase in field, and this thing would just go atomic. It would probably just explode. You're violating the laws of physics here. You're creating a perpetual motion machine. So the, um, the current has to oppose the field. It has to oppose it. It can't enhance the field because this thing would just run away. It's like a positive feedback loop and it would just keep growing and growing and growing. And eventually the coil would melt or, you know, you get so much current going through this coil, it would blow up or something nasty would, would happen. So what Lenz's law is saying that, that that induction, when you induce that current and that um, voltage, it opposes the original current. So that's where that comes from. You hear that a, a inductor imposes uh, a current going through it. It's because of the field is growing. It's inducing, using Faraday's law, it's inducing another current. And that current, it's based on Lenz's law. It's, in, it's impeding. It's opposing the original current. So in the case of decreasing, same thing applies. So, but in this case, the field now is shrinking, it's decreasing, the field is changing. Since the field is changing, it's going to induce a current and it's going to induce a voltage in this uh, coil. So here we turn off the switch. And so in this case, the current's going from say one amp to zero. The current has to decrease. So that decrease in current causes the field to decrease. And you can see here the field decreasing. And as that field is decreasing, it's inducing, by Faraday's law, it's inducing a current and a voltage in this coil. Now, in this case, since the current is going in this direction, but the current is decreasing, the current, you could think of the current as negative, OK? It's not really negative, but it's a it's a negative it's a negative decrease. So it's got to impose that. So the current is going to flow in the direction of this current, and that's why you hear that uh, an inductor does whatever it can to keep the current the same. That's why. Okay, so in the two cases you've got, uh, and it's, I've just got a couple more slides, and I'm done. So in the case where the current is increasing, you're going from zero to one amp, the field starts to increase by Faraday's law. You're inducing a current and a voltage in that, a voltage and a current in that coil, that a current has to oppose this current. Because if it didn't, and it went in the same direction, then you'd have an increase in current, you'd have a, a bigger field, then you'd have more current, and it would just be a feedback loop, right? Same thing with the uh, decreasing. So in this case, the, the current is decreasing. You've turned off the current. 
the current is uh, de de decreasing. So now the current here, uh, the, the decreasing field is going to generate a voltage and a current, which is going to impose the uh, oppose the change in current. So it's going to now produce a current in this in this direction, and uh, that's why you need to have like a, I can't remember if it's called a snubber or a, a flyback diode or uh, there's some term for it where you got to put a diode across a uh, relay coil. That's why because that coil has got a magnetic field. When you turn it off that shrinking field generates more current and that current has to go somewhere. So you put a, uh, a diode across here to, to get that current to short out. Okay, and we could demonstrate this in LT Spice quite easily. So I've got a little circuit here in LT Spice. So uh, I've got an impulse function and I set it to a rise time of one nanosecond. It's 10 volts. It lasts for 100 microseconds, and then it drops, and 300 microseconds later, it repeats. So we've got, I put a small resistor here so I could actually measure a voltage here. Um, I wanted to have a voltage drop across this a resistor, and then I've got the honker of an a inductor here so I could see the charge and discharge. So in the first case here now, the voltage is, the, uh, the pulse is turning on. So here it's like the switch turning on in your uh, converter, in your buck uh, converter. So you can see the voltage at zero and all of a sudden the voltage goes whoop, goes right up to, to 10 volts. Then it's slowly coming down, okay? Because initially the inductor through Faraday's law and Lenz's law, it's gonna impose that uh, current coming through it. And so the voltage slowly decreases down to zero steady state, there's no current flowing across here, or there is a small amount of current, but, and that's because of the, um, the windings, the resistance of uh, the windings, right? There's, there'll, so, sorry, there'll be a small voltage drop across here because of the resistance in the windings. There'll be a steady current flowing through it. Uh, once you've got a steady current flowing through the inductor, the magnetic field is not changing. It's rigid, it's, it's there, it's not changing, so you're not inducing any fields. So you could see that here, and the interesting, and so um, let, me, let me not talk about that just yet. So in the case of the, um, it turning off, so in this case now, I'm turning off the, the voltage. So all of a sudden now, the voltage is turned off at this point. Okay, so there's no voltage here coming off, this is zero here now, or it's open circuit. And so you see all of a sudden the inductor, the voltage across the inductor goes to minus 10 volts, right? The inductor has a whole bunch of charge. That magnetic field has to collapse and that energy in the magnetic field has to go somewhere. And so then you see the current slowly decreasing through it. Now, the interesting thing is, if you look at this inductor, for it to charge and discharge, here's the time. So I just took the time here for it to go from 10 volts to, I just picked one volt. Uh, and here it took 23 microseconds for it to go from 10 volts to one volt. And for it to go from minus 10 volts to minus one volts, it takes it 14 microseconds. So the time it takes for it to discharge is, you know, like half the time of it for it to charge, which makes sense because you couldn't have in this specific configuration, you couldn't have the inductor taking a longer time to dis discharge because then you'd be violating, you know, uh, laws of thermodynamics. You could create a perpetual motion machine. It's got to discharge faster. It's It's got to do with the... Um, having a reversible process, right? Something to do with having a reversible process. The reverse, the process can't be 100%. It's, you got to have losses. So that's why we get a positive and negative across the inductor when this is closed. And when it's open, that's why we get a negative. The polarity switches around. Not, not the polarity, 
but the voltage difference across the inductor is greater on this side when the switch is open and when the switch is closed, the uh, voltage is higher in this side and lower in this side. So that's it. So the next rabbit hole will be MOSFETs and I'll save that for another time.